King Lake here in Victoria is an area that has been horrendously affected by forest fires. Only years ago, this property that I'm standing on right now was absolutely engulfed in flames. It's for that reason that one builder has taken it upon himself to rethink tiny house design to try to make them resistant to forest fires. G'day Tom! Hello Bryce, how are you? Good mate, how are you doing? Uh, very well, thank you for coming down. Oh, it's my pleasure. Welcome to my house. This is a beautiful looking house. Thank you. Now this one's actually been designed to be a fire resistant tiny house. This is a fire resistant passive off-grid tiny house. First of all, what was it that actually inspired you to design this to be fire resistant? Uh, we are standing on the side of the world's worst bushfire. Behind us there are burnt trees, in the background burnt trees, houses, sheds that disappeared and I saw Victorians building tiny houses which had no resistance and I thought that could be improved upon. So I came up with the design and here we are. What goes into making a tiny house fire resistant? Well, uh, about 20 different things, a lot. Uh, from the materials, the design, the shape, the placement of where we are, the undercarriage, the mechanical components, lots of things. So yeah. first of all, this is actually a tiny house on wheels, isn't it? It is absolutely on wheels. I have skirted the underside that's to stop embers, branches landing underneath. So they are fold up skirts, fold up, they fold under and you can travel with them on. The wheels themselves I have removed because even with these shields, should they catch fire, they are a fire hazard. They do burn for a very long time and very hot. So we don't want that underneath the house. And then looking through the exterior here, walk me through the materials that you've chosen. Yeah, so we start with a corrugated iron. It's a very common tiny house cladding because it's lightweight and it's relatively cheap and easy to install. It's also fire resistant. So starting with that, then I've got one millimetre flat steel sheet as a bit of a feature. Uh, on the sides, uh, on three sides I've got timber cladding and it's a ply cladding profiled. It's got three coats of fireproof paint, intumescent paint on it, and all the gaps are also filled with intumescent cork. This is to stop it from catching fire. Uh, we've also got fireproof timber. This timber is silver top ash. Uh, you could also use jarrah, which I have here on the door. Ironbark is another one. We've got some great Australian timbers which are fire resistant, so that's what I've chosen to use here. The problem with those is that they're very dense. So they're not normally your go-to choice for a tiny house. Because of course dense also means they're very heavy. Exactly, right, but they're also very long lasting. So that's, you know, a bonus. So what goes into actually making a timber itself fire resistant? How does the density help it to be resistant to fire? Density is part of it. It's more about the ignition. So actually how difficult is it to set fire to it? A lightweight timber such as cedar would ignite very easily and is used for kindling for that reason. These timbers are up around the upper plus of 800 kilograms a metre. So that's two to three times denser than some of the softwoods. Um, Ironbark for instance up around 1100 kilograms a metre. Very dense timbers, very difficult to ignite. Should you put them in your fireplace, they'll make great firewood, but you do have to get them started. This is burn test on a traditional Australian or even North American construction. Uh, we've got some softwood, cedar, Baltic pine and radiata pine. Uh, we've got uh, some skill areas here which are going to contribute to this burn. That is the, the edges have not been rounded. Uh, we've got exposed end grain. We've even got some gaps in between the weatherboards and the weather stops. Um, we've got recycled materials used here but nothing's been filled in. And we've also got on top some maintenance issues. Some leaf litter building up in the gutter. These materials here obviously aren't going to burn, but the combination of the gutter and the roof is going to direct the fire right to where we don't want it, which is inside the roof space. And then you mentioned that it's a special kind of corking. How does that work? So I've got two different types of unusual cork on this house. We've got intumescent cork, that is it expands under heat. So it separates the heat from what's behind it. And the other one is heatproof silicon. So it'll maintain its seal uh, up to about 300 degrees. So both very useful products. And what about the windows and doors in here? So I've made them all myself. We've got two different types here. We've got the window sash made out of timber and that's glued together and fixed up. And then we've got this exterior one here with a color bond flashing, a tin flashing. That's unusual. That is made up with the timber frame itself, studs, trimmers, and the glass is set straight into that. There's no timber reveal. Um, and the color bond flashing forms the outside lip and it was, it was easy. The windows themselves, the glass is double glazed argon filled windows with toughened glass. Toughened glass, a fireproof measure, 
argon is for uh, the insulation factor. And double glazed, well, that's just standard. Excellent. So. And what are these bars you've got across the windows? So, tiny houses heat up very quickly, which you might have experienced. On a regular house, on a north facing window, we have an eave to shield it from the sun. The problem with an eave is that it sticks out. So your options would be a removable eave or hood that you screw on after you've installed it, or this. These bars act as four individual small eaves to keep the summer sun out. That is so clever. And they let the winter light in predominantly, and they also being just a three mil strip, they're actually, they don't block much of your visibility from the inside. So I've left the bottom one out, that's because my little greenhouse is inside there. What a phenomenal idea. That is so very clever. I have never seen that before. What you won't have seen before either is this. That is a bracket to hold on my fireproof shutters. So I have, in addition, some flat steel shutters, which can be lifted with one human straight onto the window and off. In about one minute, you can do a whole house. Such a good idea. So the obvious question to building a fireproof tiny house on wheels is, with a tiny house on wheels, why not just hook up the house and get away from the fire? That, that's an excellent question and it's a very dangerous premise. I do hear it a lot. Now I understand that in the US and Canada there is evidence to suggest that tiny houses get burnt less because people move them. Those fires move exceedingly slowly. Australian fires move exceedingly quickly. Uh, the fire that came through behind us moved at about 50 kilometres an hour. Wow. Uh, and it also came from both directions. And I'm on a one-way street and the end of this street burnt first. So there was no way out of here. Even the fire across the landscape can move at approximately 12 kilometers an hour on a really bad day. Wow, that's terrifying, isn't it? But really, what a great idea for the way that you've designed this. What about these tie downs here? These look really good. So one thing I had to do, being bushfire resistant, I had a lot of extra weight that had to go on. That meant I had to build the chassis very light. So predominantly the top of this is very light. The trail underneath only weighs half a ton. So we're actually, well, able to flip over in a storm until I put these on. So these make an excellent tie down, nice and tight, keep it steady. So what's this door here? So this is a controversial fireproof measure. This is a fireproof door with a gas bottle inside. I see. One problem we have with regular houses here in Australia is that gas bottles are pinned right up against the house. There's new regulations that say they have to be about 10 to 20 metres away so that if they explode, they don't ignite the house, which is a common way for houses to catch on fire. Now, being a transportable, movable unit, I can't necessarily put it 20 metres away and pipe the gas to it. So I've got a standalone fireproof box here with a vent to let any escaping gas out through the bottom. Timber door, compressed sheet, pretty tight. And then there's the deck over here. The deck is a really common ignition place for houses. Why is that? Typically, you might have vegetation around the outside of them. Uh, they might be made of a lightweight timber such as pine. They've got grooves in them, which are great for catching embers. So I've got a steel grate. I've made sure it was hollow. That's so that fire should embers land underneath. The flames don't go sideways into the house. They come straight up through, they burn out. End of the story. That is clever. And uh, we've also got some fireproof stairs here. Again, silver top ash, very difficult to ignite. And they're on a gravel base. So we've kept vegetation well away from the house. Excellent. And you've got the ladder here as well, so you've got roof access. Well, I could tell you that's a fireproofing measure, but it's not. <laughs> that's, that's a good bit of fun. Nothing nice in the city up there uh, on an evening watching the sunset. And a good way to actually get up and clean your solar panels too, right? Clean your solar panels, clean your gutters out. So actually, what is this you've got in the gutters here as well? Yeah, all uh, fireproof houses must have gutter guard. And this in itself is not a fireproofing measure. This allows the gutters to stay clean. So they have to be cleaned. The gutter guard will not clean them for you. It'll still collect debris on top. And that debris is obviously a fire hazard. It's also acting as a great filter because that's going straight into our drinking water tank. What a good idea. So how are you actually collecting the rainwater and everything here? Where does the tank go? Well, let's go to the back and have a look. So we've got gutters on both sides. The other side is very small, but I just couldn't stand to lose 20% of the water. So this top section here is a water tank. Right. It's one third of this bay window. We've got two inlets. We've got our outlet going through to our house. We've also got a bit of a drainage point there for any gunk that comes out. It can sink straight to the bottom. Also got our outlet, which is plumbed into our grey water system. Now, does that lead into a sprinkler system as well? Sprinkler system would be great. 
It's a fantastic fireproofing measure. I don't have enough water or electricity on an right. off-grid tiny house for it. If you had an additional water source and an additional electricity source, absolutely. They're right. a fantastic idea. One hazard that we have on trailers are these little guys. Uh, all the lights, there's a lot of them on such a big trailer. They melt, they burn. In this situation here, it's a very small light. It's steel cladding and I've also sealed the back side of it again with silicon so that it doesn't burn. But we do have bigger ones. They're the tail lights and they're down here. So by covering them, uh, we can reduce the ignition chances. I can't stop them melting. If this was to survive a bushfire, we would have some repairs to do. So with all of the materials that you've actually chosen for the exterior of this house, to what extent have you tried them out? Like, have you actually taken a torch to them? All of them. I have had some great experiments. It's been a lot of fun. This cube here is built in the same manner as our house. Uh, the same techniques and same materials. So inside that, I'm gonna place this glass of water and we're gonna see how hot that water gets. So after three and a half minutes of intense flame, we can take a look to see what happened here. On top, we had the intumescent paint. Uh, everything here is still intact. The timber you did not even touch it, didn't even get close to it. This is our timber wall here. You can see it's toasted the back, but no ignition whatsoever. And around here we have the colour bond side here. You can see the, the way that that intumescent cork has puffed up at the bottom to protect the material underneath. This has actually fared probably the worst out of all the sides. Uh, we did have some flame ignition along the side here. Uh, that was the cork and the silicon uh, burning. Uh, but it, it went, the fire went out very quickly. Here's our cup of water, still intact. And would you believe it, that's still properly cold. Inside these walls, we've got quite a high density uh, blow-in insulation. Uh, I did spend a bit of extra money on it, but I think it's worth it. What that's for is not for crapping the temperature inside the house. It's in case of bushfires to prevent the, the temperature from getting inside. With the insulation and the timber, it's now up to an R2.1 which isn't particularly high, but it is very high for a tiny house. In an event of a fire, I would hope that you had somewhere else to retreat to, other than the tiny house. But if you didn't, we don't want you to get burnt inside there. You really have considered all the facets of this, haven't you? I hope. I, I really do hope I have. I would love to see some science on it. I don't have it. I'm a builder, I'm not an engineer. So yeah. I've started with the building. I've got two more fireproofing measures to show you. And they're right here at the front door. The first is uh, an ember-proof strip at the bottom. There's actually two of them, outside and inside, coupled with some fireproof beading on the inside. The last fireproofing measure I've got to show you is the electronic box, which usually sits under the trailer chassis. It's the emergency brake system. It's a battery. Batteries melt, and they burn, and they explode in a fire. So we don't want that underneath the trailer chassis. I've got it inside in relative safety. Great. Right. It's right next to all my other electronics. What a good idea. Cool, well, let's go in and see the inside. Wow, I love the style of this place. Thanks very much. You've really thought very three-dimensionally with this design. Yeah, so I wanted to make it obviously as open as possible, including not blocking off one space from another. I started with the larger aspects of it, the kitchen, the bed, and the bathroom. I've tried to make it really light. I've used lightweight timbers. You'll see if you look around, like there's no large cabinetry items. Everything's pretty hollow and open without affecting the usage. So what are the dimensions of this house? So we're at a full width. 2.5. We're approximately five meters long, plus the bay window on the back. And with a full height, so I'm 4.2. One of my absolute favorite features is this window garden. That looks so nice. So one thing I absolutely wanted was a herb garden ready to pick and use. There's nothing like fresh herbs. They're totally different. Coming out of a pot doesn't work. And having to walk all the way down to the garden, if you haven't seen the rest of the block, it's quite hilly. I'm not going there again, you know, for a bit of basil. Yeah. So, Everything's here. I've got a drainage system underneath it. I can put about eight to ten litres of water in there at once. It'll last about two weeks. And again, tons of light from the north windows. So they're, they're taking off really well. And then a nice cooking space here? Yeah. So, some pretty simple additions. Sink with a chopping board on top. Double burners here. This also adds, uh, doubles as our hot water system. One problem we have in addition with the fire restrictions is that I don't want gas on the outside and the outside of the house was difficult enough to clad as it was. I didn't want pipes going in and out and hot water services to worry about as right. well. So I've done on stovetop hot water. It's on a pulley system and we've got our own tap for it. So you fill this up, heat up the water. 
hoist it, it up, up and then it grabs your shower. straight to your shower. That is so clever. Got a temperature gauge on it. Uh, we've also got an additional tap to go straight into the sink. Off-grid houses are going to go crazy about that. Possibly. <laughs> I, I'm pretty keen with the mechanism. I think it's working really well. It is awfully loud, so I do have my mind on the quieter one. Gotcha. Still, what a clever idea there. And then talk to me about the lounge space here. Yeah, so uh, we've got a uh, lounge doubling as a dining room. So the chairs are designed as uh, dining table chairs, uh, as well as lounges. And then the table pulls across, you can fit six people around the table. Great. And we've got one extra addition, which is that the table legs drop off, drops down to the chair height, cushions go on, you've got a second bed. Brilliant. And then it looks like you've actually got quite a bit of storage space up here as well, and then even a spare bed. Yeah, kids' bed, or oh, I say kids, uh, fits me. More storage at the top, uh, which is obviously necessary, and some a bit of greenery too, to light it up. And then can we see the bathroom? Sure, so here we are. Uh, we're in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> curtain across, you've got your privacy. You've got a pretty standard size shower. It's, it's 900 millimeters square um, with our gravity feed tap above it. So we've also got in here, composting loo kit with a few shelves and a bathroom cabinet. So composting loos, they need to be vented, right? So how have you done the vents? Because that would be a plastic pipe running on the outside of the house, wouldn't it? There's multiple vents, not just the toilet, but there's also a bathroom vent and a vent from the top of the house to really act as a whole exhaust uh, fan for the house during, uh, during the hot days. And they've all covered in uh, fireproof mesh. Here's the best feature, uh, chalkboard toilet door. If you'd like to leave your mark for us. Alrighty. I love that. You can write all of your inspirational quotes on your toilet door. I like everyone that comes here to uh, leave their mark. <laughs> Alright. And then sleeping loft above us here. Yeah, so come with me. Full length hangers. So you can keep your dressing robe nice and straight, which is very important. Got some shelves up here as well, enough to keep all your belongings in, and plenty of roof space. Brilliant. And then this is another one of your fireproof shutters, is it? This is. I'm going to say this is the last fireproof measure I've got. One problem with the shutters being on the outside is that they act as a complete blackout. And also, you can't see if you're in an emergency situation, you can't see what's going on outside. So the last fireproof shutter actually opens from the inside. That's very clever. It also acts as your curtain and a fantastic blackout if you want a daytime sleep. One of the things that I really like about the way that you've done this house is obviously you've thought so much about the practical features and fireproofing and everything like that, but it's also brilliantly designed and just feels really homey in here. Well, thank you. I mean, no, I put a lot of thought into it. Uh, it's nice, it's warm, it's, uh, it's really homely. Everything feels uh, really organic to me, so I'm really pleased with what I've ended up with. So we're on your property right now. And did you actually own this land when it was hit by the fires? I did not. I moved in two years ago. Uh, the worst fires were in 09, so it was quite a while ago. A lot of the, the landscape still bears those marks. And I saw the fires with my own eyes and I can understand what the people here went through and what it would take to survive a fire like that. This property was pretty hard hit. Sheds, a lot of trees, a lot of property damage done here. A lot of houses lost in this area and lives lost as well. Mm. And I think we're slightly underprepared for an event which has been basically predictable for a long time now. So I like to see that standard lifted. We are finally now in Victoria bringing up our building standards to match those risks. Mate, this is such a brilliant design. The thought and attention that you have put into every single aspect of this house really impresses me. And most importantly, I think this is a really relevant design for the times. Congratulations on a brilliant project. Thank you very much. Thanks for you for coming to see it. My pleasure. In our travels, we've seen so many places that have been really affected by forest fires. And this project is really exciting to me because I think it is so well thought out and includes so many features that we could easily be designing into our homes to make them just that little bit more resistant. Right now, it's very relevant. And I think that projects like this are so important.